those of you who were here last week um, heard this, but I want to just give um, a little bit about Ben. Ben is an associate professor of history at the University of Manitoba. He uh, headed the Judaic Studies program for a few years. He teaches, he writes, he lectures on European history, Jewish history, historiography, gender studies, and feminist theory. He grew up in post-war Germany, transitioned from female to male while he finished his PhD in Columbia University on gender and Judaism in uh, 19th century Germany. And uh, he's a member of Orthodox community in Winnipeg and uh, a play written by Daniel Thel Elf is in process about an Orthodox trans character inspired by Ben. The play is God willing gonna be scheduled to open in Winnipeg in April if such things happen in April. And uh, uh, we had an incredible introduction to Ben's thinking last uh, week. Uh, he's going to review it and then we're going to move forward. I just, you know, uh, very thankful that Ben is with us and uh, this, uh, yeah, the time is yours. Thank you so much. Thanks, Steve, and again for the lovely introduction for everyone coming out this morning. It's really, you know, very exciting. Um, well, and for you, it's actually not morning anymore. <laughs> um, well, let me first of all say, so last week um, was quite challenging, so it's going to be less, um, less radically challenging today, and more autobiographical, talking about myself and my experience. I'm just trying to share here. So this is the agenda now for today. So we, I'm going to sort of re revisit some points from last week and then move into really my, uh, my narrative. Um, and the main points are between two realities, growing up in post-war Germany, my gender story, my spiritual opening, and then really some, you know, new thinking I've been, I've done since the, um, the publication also of this, the, the piece. Um, um, and then about the eradication of the self and mystical thought and then gender indeterminacy as a spiritual practice. I wanted to first go back to actually a question that was posed last time that we didn't get to about if a person was growing up um, without society in complete isolation, um, that whether um, they, would not, they would not know their gender. And actually, um, my answer to this would be, first of all, they would not have a gender. So how real is gender? So I said, not real at all. It has no ontological status outside of the cultural ma matrix that creates it. It is entirely abstract, complete fantasy of fabrication. And we've talked about this, I mean, really coming out of, of gender theory. It is, it is um, the symbolic system. It's part of the symbolic system. It is, there's nothing, it is not grounded in any um, material reality for what you want. So it's not real at all. On the other hand, I talked about how extremely real it is, how powerful, lasting, enduring, how it really is it's part of and saturates every aspect of human society and human culture, not despite, but because it is so flexible, fluid, multifaceted, and elusive. And now I, I like, I wanna, and I've talked about this, but to this, to this sort of final screen, I wanted to add, add it is crucial, necessary aspect of um, being human being intelligible, being real, having a gender is part of it. So, um, so standing in, it is, it is a, it's an essential part of being sort of part of human society. So any, I mean, a question that comes up, of course, in this context would then be, you know, how is, is do, do animals have a gender um, or, you know, do, do, do animals have a language? Um, do they have a symbolic system that's similar? But I, I would, <laughs> I would want to bracket that question, actually. <laughs> so, are there any? Is there anything that you would like to revisit from last time, from last week? Is there any? Is there any question that you still want to raise? Because it was it was dense and it raised, you know, all sorts of issues about. Mm, no, ah. Well, let me just yes. one <laughs> thing. I think it will lead us. It will lead us in an interesting direction, and I think that you know one of the defenses for homosexuality is is that there are like some four hundred species that express same sex relations. But that being said, um, uh, one of the the useful 
useful, okay. One of the useful but sometimes tendacious frames for understanding gender is that nature is dominated by the differences between male and female elements of the species, dominated by it, right? In ways that are not cultural. So I, don't, I know you want to bracket it, but it's used as a way of essentializing what you called both real and not real. And so at some juncture, it would be interesting to account for nature. Very, very interesting. Um, you know, and I completely agree um, in terms of, and I mean, and the question is really, um, I mean, to what degree do, do, do animals have language? To what degree do they have a symbolic, you know, a symbolic system is there, but certainly sort of, the, um, 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 you know, do they, do, I mean, you can also say, do animals have a culture? Do, do ants have a culture? Do, do butterflies, you know, monkeys, I mean, you, wherever you like to go, right? Is, you want to call this culture. I mean, I mean, I think that's really the territory we, we go to. And then, you know, I still wanted to reply also to, to Rabbi Schaffner, your comment on Lacan. Absolutely, I talked about Lacan, because that is really also gender theory um, is based on, um, I mean, really what is relevant in terms of gender theory, um, psychoanalytic thought, and um, Lacan is, is very much sort of the, the you know, the, the um, law of the father, et cetera. I mean, we've, so that's, I introduced all of this. So um, um, this gender is a symbolic system. Okay, so maybe we should just um, move on. Yeah, actually, Ben, I just had a follow up on Steve's question, which is in giving that answer, are you differentiating between gender which is cultural and sex, which is part of nature, part of the, the natural substrate, biological substrate, let's say? Yes. Okay. Yes, absolutely. So whereby, of course, um, I mean, and that's why when I talked about this, the, the term gender and the concept of gender was introduced by feminists um, in the 1970s. Before it didn't, I mean, I, I talked about how it, um, it was only, it comes only from linguistics. So, um, um, you know, to, to differentiate to um, physical sex. Of course, in gender theory today, I mean, or very, very soon, um, um, the insight was that sex doesn't have, that also sex doesn't have a meaning without gender. I mean, without the symbolic system, without giving meanings about the, I mean, the pure physicality in some way, if it's not given a meaning in culture, it has, it is irrelevant. It is not, I mean, it matters well not exist. Materiality, physicality without meaning, without having sort of been assigned a space in the cultural system, symbolic system of, you know, human culture is, is you know, has no, in some way you can say it has no reality. Like physical reality, I mean, I mean, that's no, of course, pu I'm pushing it a little, right? Our physical reality beyond Without without meaning, without you know being being without having a name. I mean that's you know giving things a name is huge, right? And we have this. I mean, of course, just thinking about Bereshit, of course, you know, there's there's cr the creation of physical reality, but then there's there's meaning and naming is part of it. There is no physical reality without without language, name, and in that case, of course, language is is before the physical reality. Now I'm moving really to my um, to my own piece. Um, and we are staying with the the, the overarching topic, the the, 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 the arc that um, binds us together is thinking about reality and the nature of reality and the way we, we live in realities and, and the, the multiplicity of realities really. So in terms of my own story, just very um, 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 roughly um, background. So my father was Jewish and a camp survivor from Vienna, secular when I grew up. Um, he had um, survived as a socialist and later in life affiliated and engaged in Judaism. My mother was not Jewish, had a Catholic background from Moravia and a bit of a mystic. And um, this growing up in post-war Germany, in many ways, I really consider, you know, the center of my story and the center of my, of, of who I am and my, 
if you want my condition. So um, I'm going to read a little from this piece now because I think it really it summarizes this these particular you know being caught between these different realities in post-war Germany quite um, you know very succinctly. So I was born in Germany in 1959 in the shadow of the Shoah when the killings were still very close. Sitting across people in the subway, we, those who had been persecuted in the Nazi period for political reasons or as Jews, and their children, we always wondered what they had done, those who sat across us, just a few years earlier. My teachers, the doctors we had to see in emergencies, the policemen who directed the traffic, were not necessarily all Nazis, but at best, they had grown up and had been trained in the Nazi period. The military culture of fascism and murder shaped their choice of words and colored their tone of voice, their body language and posture, their attitude and their approach to the world. When I met another child, I knew within a few minutes whether her or his father had been in the German army or worse, or whether his or her parents had been in the camps or just returned from exile as Jews or as socialists. References to experiences and realities in the war, the army, the ghettos, camps, or exile belong to children's talk. And the murderous past was still very real. The murderous past was still very real. It was all around us. Murder was inscribed in the buildings, some of which had been deportation centers or Nazi police stations, into physical objects and into the gestures and words of humans. The past was not over yet. It became present every time the doorbell rang and my father's face turned white with terror. I lived in multiple worlds. The world of a safe childhood with my sisters at the outskirts of Munich, with love placed strawberry bushes in the garden, open fields behind the house, and the smell of grass. And I lived in a world in which children just like me had been picked up in the early morning. The SS, the voices of SS men in the folds of my daydream on the way to the station, the sound of the trains going east and the smell of gas. It was hard for me to feel at home in either reality and to accept a life that I did not seem to deserve. Why me? Why was I alive and others had been killed? The world of my childhood in the 1960s in post-war Germany lacked coherence. And we talked quite a bit about coherence last time. It seems to me it was multiple worlds. There was a world of terror that was not inhabitable and the other world that did not feel fully real and, and certainly not safe and that could not be a home. And it seems to me today that the first world, the world of terror and the presence of the, the, the Nazi reality, um, no, the first world was actually two worlds, which were mapped onto each other on the dream level below my consciousness. First, there was a, the, my father's memories, stories, his terror in my body. And secondly, the presence of unredeemed souls whose distress absorbed the light. In a recent conversation with old friends in Berlin on a long Shabbat summer evening, as the light was turning in the room with the windows open above the trees, it has this conversation confirmed my recollection. There was not only the terror, the nightmares, anxiety, strange habits and the frozenness of our parents, the things that they told us and that they did not tell us, but there was also the visceral presence of the dead that restricted the freedom of our thought. As a child, I could not hold this, and I did not grow a skin that was of one piece. Disorientation and dread made me numb many years of my life. So this is really talking about growing up in with a sense of sort of a double reality, a three-part reality, or no reality, no coherence. So this um, 
you know, re-engaging now with, with, this, with this concept of coherence. The sense that there's always, that the, the reality you live in is not, is not reliable, there's always a double reality, there's always another le level of reality going on. In a language of psychology, of course, um, the, 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 the term is trauma. So you can say very much trauma prevented me from developing a sense of a coherent self and of a stable gender. I mean, that is very much a narrative that one can tell. And um, resulting in states of terror, anxiety, dissociation, and that is, um, is quite, um, you know, in line with really this story of lifelong emotional struggle that is, you know, still there. We're moving now briefly into my gender story and then back to spiritual um, opening and again a little bit of text. Um, so I always say that as a child I was bi-gendered. So I was on one hand I was a girl, I was um, you know, not anatomically a girl, I was one of three sisters, I was, I liked, I mean as, well, as I often say I liked being part of this girl club, I mean it was just there were things that were really lovely about being you know, being a girl. On the other hand, um, it was very clear I was my father's son. So my, my, I was tied to his history. I was tied to sort of, I was different than my, my mother and my, I mean, you know, in terms of the persecution, the Jewishness. Um, and the, so my, my masculinity is very much tied up with Jewishness. Um, then I had a very, unhappy, angry, heterosexual adolescence and youth, like trying to be a woman, being a woman towards men was just <laughs> not a happy situation for me. Um, and of course, you know, I mean, not for many, I mean, adolescence is often hard and, and you know, being a young woman is particularly challenging for anyone, I suppose. Um, then I came out as a lesbian. I lived um, about 20 years as a lesbian. That worked relatively well. So I liked women, or I still like women. And, um, um, you know, and, and this living as a lesbian was sort of, had an aspect of maleness, um, also, you know, also that worked well. Um, but finally I came out as trans male um, when I was around 40 and as, um, Stephen just wrote during the time I was um, finishing my PhD in, in New York City by the time I had you know gone to Columbia um, and by the time I also had um, um, started to move into Jewish practice I had a um, reform conversion in Berlin that was not so much a religious move at the time it was mostly about um, wanting to learn about Judaism beyond concentration camps I mean that's sort of a way of summing it up and um, what is important is um, this throughout all this time, um, emotionally struggling and hoping, and, and at the time of gender transition, still very much also hoping, sort of trying to fix me, trying to um, um, find a place that is stable, that is reliable, a way that sort of to be at home in the world, a way to feel real, where to sort of both have sort of a, a self, an identity, in a relationship to the to the world that is, you know, that felt that feels livable. I mean, that was always um, that was always sort of um, um, a challenge. Um, things then stabilized tremendously as I moved to Winnipeg in 2005. I got a professor so in, in my mid 40s. I got this professorship in in um, in European history at the University of Manitoba. And that, um, so finally I reached a place of physical, like existential stability, safety. This was an invitation to stay. Um, I was, you know, it, it could, you know, an invitation to have a home. And it was a situation in which I um, did the full gender transition. So, um, so in, in some ways, all the pieces now were in place to sort of relax and become real if you want, to have a sort of a stable real life and to sort of to heal my, my relationship to reality if you want, to become fully, um, fully at home in the world and in my body and in myself and in my life. 
but in, instead of that, sort of a new, something new opens. In, instead of thinking, you think sort of gaps closing, if you want a new, I don't want to call it a gap, but, but a new, sort of new levels of double reality opened. So that, um, and there's a longer story. I mean, I'm very, very much sort of abbreviating and, and condensing um, 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 some of the, the storyline, of course, and, you know, and some of this is spelled sort of in more, sort of with, with more nuance in, in this published piece. Um, but a, a, central, a central sort of turning point was when my stepmother, who I loved very much, um, my, my father's um, third wife, um, died in 2008, and at the Shiva for her in Berlin, I laid to fill in for the first time. Um, and it was just breathtaking. I mean, I, I felt this absolutely enormous um, um, connection. And, and here I move now to reading from my text again. Um, in the following months, I had the sense that Lilith wanted me to do something to say prayers, but her sons and my father were saying Kaddish. And I did not understand what she might want from me. Yet she did not let go. And I kept thinking about the morning in Berlin when I had laid to fill in, but of course I didn't even have any. And, but after months, during the Passover holidays, during days, Holamwed, I could not wait any longer. And I started davening without the feeling there. I mean, of course, <laughs> um, what you're not supposed to do with the whole word anyway, but I, I had I, nothing I, I mean, I knew about at that time. I was not at home in the liturgy, which seemed rather confusing to me. I sought help on the internet. In the beginning, I probably only said a few central prayers, the Shema, the Amida, Aleinu. But from the first day on, the world around me looked different. The color of all things seemed deeper and more intense, more shiny. I had passed through a gate, and it seemed to me that Lilith relaxed and left. I've missed morning prayers less than a handful of times since. I do not want to be without this door to radiance. The next um, part of this opening of this of this really that unfolded now was two years later again around a death around somebody moving to the other side as I like to say it was when my mother Charlotte Custon died in peace at the exact time when I was saying she died in Berlin at the exact time when I was saying Shacharit and length to fill in in Winnipeg. And it seemed to me that she ascended on the connection that I was holding. I felt her giggling with pleasure about how light she was without the weight of her body as she rose. And the day after her funeral for which I had come to Berlin, I was bathed in light. It was a gray and rainy day but the room where I stayed was breathtakingly illuminated. A magnificent translucent light and a deep peace and enormous still joy. In an email I sent to friends that day I wrote, the color of my mother's death is not blackness, but radiance, playful and tender like a summer meadow so much gentle light. This light remained with me for months. It shone from behind or through trees and bushes. It was a little overwhelming. Being in astonishment and awe, I hardly mourned. In the weeks I was, in these weeks, I was able to distinguish between the light of the sun and the other light, except at dawn and dusk, when something happened that puzzled me. In the winter, the sun rises late in Winnipeg, and as I came to pray at the time before sunrise, when dark and light both mingle and separate, breathing into the Hebrew words made me lower myself into an opening, into that space between light and dark, 
And I learned how to slide down the ayin and the dalit of the Shema a little less than an hour before sunrise and to lower myself into a tremendous flow of radiance and joy. That winter, I also became increasingly aware of the shininess and the glowing food. In particular, in fruit, berries and nuts, but really in everything. Therefore, I, I had to do something and I began saying blessings over food. And I learned that speaking the words of Brachot magnifies the radiance in an apple or a broccoli. And I observed how the song and the light that flows between the twigs of trees and bushes and the blades of grass, the petals of flower and the leaves of plants and the particles of rocks, the grains of sand and dirt and snow are the same or of the same kind at what flows in the spaces between the Hebrew letters of liturgy and Torah. And in prayer, one can tie them all together. And in the same winter in which I developed this pre-sunrise prayer practice, or davening nets, or I don't know what it's called, I started keeping Shabbat too. It was just too strange not to do so, even though I didn't have a community for it, and I only had a very general understanding of what keeping Shabbat entails. Yet from the first week, I fell in love with her like nothing else. When eternal time shines through the fabric of the day, shimmers through the surface of the apparently linear sequence of hours, I have learned that the space-time pattern that we call reality, back to reality, that this that our space-time pattern that we call reality is not more than a particular mode of apparent coherence. And here we are back to what we talked about last week. One could say that in this period, my failure to be sufficiently off and in this world, my inability to feel fully real and coherent started to turn from a liability into a strength, or in religious language, from a curse into a blessing. In the summer after my mother died, I sat in the grass at my mother's grave for a long time, in stillness and widely open, when a small red fox came and stood across the grave facing me. For a time behind time, we looked at each other and shared consciousness. And I could feel the fox listening to the stream of the universe without being constrained by the boundedness of the human psyche, our ego. Under the guidance of the fox and later in a similar encounter with two owls in Colorado, I learned how to withdraw my soul from coherence and meaning and to listen to the flow itself, to the deep murmur and exhilarating stream of joy and light that illuminates every snowflake. Today I listen to and with trees and rocks in the teaching that um, Plants and animals and domim, the silent ones, minerals, are closer to God than we are, appears right to me. It seems that rocks and trees, for instance, always face God. While we know how to turn our gaze away. Thus, my spontaneous watching of light has expanded into a practice of listening. And I've come to cherish halakha as a fabric of light. So that is really the context of my move into observance and into, you know, then orthodoxy. And um, it's interesting, even for me, you know, after rereading this a week, um, a week later, having, after having talked about realities, it's again about me living in multiple realities. There's another reality that opened up 
um, beyond the, the material reality, really. I mean, or that I became aware of. So um, the question is, is, of course, how much has to do of this has to do with trauma? How much, you know, has to do with the lack of, co of a coherent gender? How much has to do with this awareness of the dead? Or it's really too you know, two women after my mother and Lily to have opened this gate for me. I mean, they're very, very clear. And the question is, of course, um, what is what is cause and what is consequence in my life? What is the effect? And and I don't know. I mean, I'm sort of, I love playing around with, with different ideas and to connect my experience to, and that's really what I'm, what I'm doing in this, you know, in this, in this series. Um, sort of connect my, my intellectual sort of grasp of, um, I was about to say reality, realities and relation and my, my personal experience and try to make sense of it, but, but I, I don't have answers. So the, um, I have many more questions and answers and that's of course beautiful because questions keep opening and that is, you know, and that is realities unfolding. And again, that is so similar to, to you know, what we know from Jewish textuality. Um, then of course, so, but, you know, this question, what is reality? And here I have a confession to make. So in my, you know, I, of course, you know, as I, in the meantime, I've been, you know, make sense of my experience and, and looking at, you know, and of course I found, I found out that I'm not the first one to, to sort of, <laughs> um, you know, have, have, have similar experiences or in, in insights. I mean, the Zohar is full of it. Um, and I've also um, come in, in my, my questioning um, across a group of Sufis here in Winnipeg and th that have, has been very, very fascinating. And one of the things, and what I, um, um, just to say now, that I learned um, from them um, and about Sufism, and, and, and I'm actually not sure whether that's Islam in general, that God is of course called the reality, or reality with capital R um, is God. Um, and of course, and, and that, you know, the, the, and that the reality that we live in is sort of a, sort of an external layer of the ultimate reality. Um, of, of, of divinity. And of course, and, you know, we know this from Neoplatonism, that is in Kabbalah, in mysticism, um, um, that God, light and love that flows in the universe is, is, is reality and everything else is sort of a, removed from the, the, the core of, of reality. So, um, um, not, a, not a very new insight. <laughs> Um, but personally, what I've pursued in the past decades, um, or the past decade really, so not more than 10 years, um, is systematically embracing and mapping myself on this transcendent reality. So from, I mean, it, it, it's not, and like sometimes people call me a seeker, it's not right. I haven't, I mean, it, it, it found me. <laughs> I didn't, when, when it happened, I didn't, I didn't seek anything. Um, but now, of course, I've been, I mean, once it found me, I've been cultivating it. I mean, I've been falling in love with it. I mean, there's no, how can I not, right? So, um, so, so I've been my, I've been, I've, I've, I've developed a full practice and it's really, in many ways, it's the most important thing in my life, this mapping myself on this transcendent reality. And I've learned that coherence, ego and self are in a way like obstructing becoming a vessel for light. So I'm moving now into the one piece, um, um, eradication of the self in mystical thought. Um, let me take this away again. Um, so it's very, it's quite clear that this, this concept um, um, is a central concept in all mystical traditions. And one of the things that I found interesting and appealing in Sufism is that it has a systematic theory and ex explicit guidance um, about how to achieve this ultimate state of self-dissolution in which humans can fully manifest God's qualities in the world. According to Sufi teachings, there are seven stages that the nafs of a pious man or woman ideally traverses. And women, um, there's much, much more space for women, much more examples of, 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 of um, 
traditionally also women in, in Sufi um, history. Um, so the nafs um, in Arabic um, means something like self or ego, um, like very roughly. And of course, it has the same word as the same root as the, the Hebrew term nefesh. Um, so the journey of a Sufi trainee leads from the lower nafs, and one, which one follows one's physical cravings through successive um, stages of self-awareness and quite, quite rigorous, um, um, also ascetic um, disciplines um, into um, in, to sort of in which the, the, the heart is made open into um, In, oops, into um, fana. So fana in Sufism, the annihilation of the self in God, um, when the illusion of a separate self dissolves, when one reaches the stage of self-dissolution, and now I'm just reading from your screen, one becomes a vehicle um, through which the qualities of God can manifest in the world. The Sufis talk about this as dying before one dies. Um, so in the final um, stages, when all ego has been eradicated, um, the human being functions as a perfectly polished mirror, reflecting the totality of God's qualities from the beyond into the here and now. Judaism, of course, and especially Hasidut, has very, very similar ideas. Though, to my knowledge, it lacks a comprehensive and fully developed theoretical and practical system about how the pious is to reach this full self-eradication. Self In a Jewish context, of course, you know, it's called Bitul Hayesh, literally the annulment of eradication of being. Thus, the Slonema Rebbe, for example, describes the ego of Moses as ground to dust, like the golden calf was utterly ground into dust. The Torah speaks of Moses' great humility in for Chazal, for the rabbinic tradition. It is this humility that enables Moses to encounter God face to face, to become the recipient of God's teachings of the Torah. In other words, Bitul Hayesh made Moses transparent to God's word. Or as a Talmudic passage states, revelation occurs when one makes one's soul like the desert. And I love actually this little supplication at the end of, of the Amida um, that talks about that we ask to have our, um, our nafshi, our soul to, to made as, 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 as dust. I mean, to me, that, that speaks of the same idea. Um, and as Hasidut holds, the, um, even in the post-biblical world, you, where humans are unable to attain the spiritual statue of Moses, the practice of Bitul Hayesh can let you reach the level of ayin, of nothing, where man is not, so God can dwell within him. Oh, how are we doing? Not too bad. Um, and here I have now, because of course, what, what I do, since I'm a scholar more than, you know, in my, in my, um, by trade, um, I read scholarly literature on Kabbalah and um, <laughs> sort of read it not for scholarly purposes, we, we might say. Um, so here's... Um, um, by a book by Elliot Wilson, where he talks about um, um, Chabad and Chabad ideas of Bitul Hayesh and saying um, um, that sort of every pious Jew can reach this absolute annihilation of the self. And then very Wolfson with a, with a state of monopsychic absorption in the light of the essence, which is initiated in the Torah. And um, Wolfson quotes the last Chabad Rebbe Menachem Mendel Schneerson as saying, the extinction of one's will in relation to the will of the Blessed One affects a disclosure of the light of the infinite, which Schneerson characterizes as a supreme form of love. So in short, 
both Sufism and Hasidism associate the eradication of the nafs or bitul hayesh with the human capacity of experiencing and channeling divine love and light. Five minutes. So this is the context here. Let me stop this, this almost there. This is the context in which I've come to embrace my position of halachic gender indeterminacy. As we discussed last week, I have fully transitioned and, you know, and, and testosterone have made me coherent to the outside world and provide some stability. Halachically, I live in this place of gender indeterminacy and I explain this more in my published text and we can go back to this. Um, and I expect most of you are familiar with the situation. So in Orthodox shows, I sit with a man and I can get an aliyah with, like, like a man, but I cannot be counted in a minion. I can be counted as one of three men in a zimmen, but not for the words where 10 men are required. And I love this. I inhabit two places that are usually thought as mutually exclusive. And I experience my gender indeterminacy as mapping myself on the radical contingency of the divine. I've come to understand my sidestepping of a coherent gender identity as an act of cultivating fana or bitul hayesh. And I'm going back now to my last screen. Um, I wrote in my published text, I've withdrawn from, from the contemporary hegemonic ideal of a coherent and self-contained, self-determined and fully bounded individual whose sex and gender are in alignment with, our, with each other, producing coherence by speaking the same truth, the truth that medical experts and mental health professionals can confirm. And I like to add now, I need to hold enough coherence, I need to hold on to enough coherence and enough of a self to be able to operate in the world and not to sink into the abyss in which the lack of meaning destroys all symbolic order. So, so, you know, so I need some coherence. I obviously need coherence. And, and, and I still can experience a lack of coherence quite painful. At the same time, and I'm reading again, I long to strip my soul of as much self and as much coherence as I can so that it can be a mirror that reflects and a conduit to the stillness of the light and the love of the source of all being that we call the Blessed Holy One. Incredibly thrilling and, uh, and tremulous in some ways, and, and to be honest, also disturbing. <laughs> um, you know, C.S. Lewis writes that, um, that both, both the Satan and God wish to gain adherence. The only difference which, to gain, which to gain what? Which to gain adherence. People who, who serve them, who worship oh, them, oh, oh. who identify with them, who, adherent. Okay, who, yeah. are, who are who are yeah, who are their supplicants or, or the only difference is is that the Satan erases the boundaries of the selves of his servants. And Kadosh who retain in in giving ourselves to God, God reaffirms the boundaries of the self in order not to annihilate. So I have, I bristle at the annihilation of the self, but find the fuzziness of the self a little bit more, I mean, it finds, to, it seems to me like a space where, where we, where Judaism can engage. And you did, you articulated at the end that, that you realized you don't want to completely annihilate, but you see that maybe as a failure or a weakness. I see it as a necessity. And I wondered if you would, you know, because we've spoken before about this, and you seem to be sometimes more, uh, um, uh, um, uh, ex for example, community is incredibly dependent on in, in, on both 
a, a, a kind of letting go of intensity of self and an affirmation of it. You can't do community if you're not a self. The only, you know, you just, you, you disappear into the, into the, you know, into your own world with divine. So I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to find kind of like where, how you navigate. I don't know <laughs> if this interests anybody else, but there you go. I would say, let's say, don't answer that question now. Wait, let's wait for that discussion next week. And I want to hear from other people. Mm -hmm. I agree. Maybe just um, that particular discussion, I think we're going to re-engage re with next week. Um, what, what is fascinating, where I'd like to follow up, is this, you're starting out between, you know, the Satan and Kadosh Baruch Hu. So this, the, 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 most, the most frightening, the most terrifying, the most, the most sort of evil, right? Um, um, and, and the divine being sort of aspects of the same thing. I mean, and of course, and that's, you kind of go, I mean, the Zoharic ideas that there is no evil outside of God, right? I mean, you have, you have that, and that is, and so madness and enlightenment, of course, if, you, if that's the language you want to use, are again, the aspects of each other. They are there. And here I'd actually want to make a, you know, I can't help thinking about this, this week's parasha, Kitavo, you have this, the sequence of our rule. And to me, there is so much light. I mean, it is just this, this, because, and when you look at the words, it's all in there. It's just the rash tabida. And when I look at the text, it is just, I mean, it's, it's just illuminated in a way. I mean, these words are illuminated in a way they're, they're radiant with light in a way that stands out even from the rest of the text. So, so the sort of the, I mean, which really speaks to, to your observation, sort of destruction and, and, and or maybe even the self-destruction and, you know, divine light are not, they're opposites, but in some level, they're not. So part of what uh, draws me to you all the time when, my, when you and when we've spoken is how your insights are that you've you gleaned from this end up becoming not just a resource for trans people, but a resource for everyone. But, but on some level, this session, more than I've ever heard you before, seems to be a kind of rejection of coherence that is ordinary for many people as opposed to um, uh, like a weakening of it. And I'm, I'm like, I'm wondering how this sits with people who are cisgender and straight to hear this um, without thinking that it, um, it's a, basically a broadside attack on, on what they consider to be their own realities. I'm just kind of like, I'm trying to kind of figure out how, how to translate this as a, as a, a learning that without trauma uh, um, comes alive for people. What, what, what does this trans experience have to say for you? Maybe it's for next week for Judaism writ large and Jewish communities um, of the ones similar to the ones you're part of. I think that is really the question for next week. And that's, okay. that's a type of, that's a type of um, thing I hope to engage with and talk to you and talk. Thank you so much, Ben. This was really wonderful. It's beautiful listening to you read. Thank you. <clears throat> Learning with you. Thank you. But you know, but I mean, what is also clear is, you know, what I'm talking about is this, is, I mean, is this really very, very, um, different level, you know, and when I was like, what about, you know, 20 years ago, when I was in the midst of my own gender transition as a much younger person, mm -hmm. it is terrifying when mm -hmm. your coherence, your, your, your skin, your meaning, your, your, I mean, it's a wilderness to, you know, to go, to have your gender fall apart or not have your gender not, not be coherent, to not feel fully real mm -hmm. because you you feel wrong in who you are or who as pe you know as who who you seem have to be in the world. I mean, it's 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 a, it's a, it's, a, it's a absolutely terrifying wilderness. 
-hmm. And again, you know, you've been with Steve's comment, Steve, Stephen comments, the, you know, sort of the terrifying, I mean, and I've just been uh, so blessed that this, this terror, I mean, both the, I mean, some combination, I suppose, of both my, this, you know, this terror of growing up with this, in this post-war, post-genocide reality with this aware, like, of the, I mean, sort of this rupture of who I am and my sort of this gender drama that was so, you know, has been so difficult and then, you know, has opened up into something beautiful. I mean, it's, it is just, and it's absolutely unearned. And it's, it's just a blessing. <laughs> yeah. first, I mean, first of all, you know, like at the beginning when this started happening, I was like, I don't deserve this. You like my rabbi friend, friend should, you know, experience this, not me. Like, like, <laughs> like you know, it's wrong. You know, like, but at some point I ended up just accepting yeah. it as a, as a, as a act of grace. Mm -hmm. I, I just uh, heard an interview with Leonard Cohen that, uh, that um, is incredibly beautiful that talks about God consciousness that breaks through all the categories. It's fascinating that it was Leonard Cohen mm -hmm. is articulating it, not a rabbi. And um, I'm happy to send it to people because I think that after this session, it's a really interesting mm -hmm. portrayal of the power of God consciousness in this whole process. And, uh, you know, kind of redefining in a way, expanding Jewishness to include more than peoplehood and, and morality. Mm -hmm. To expand it to include ritual and to expand it to include a kind of, the, you know, as you say, if, if not the annihilation of the self, a kind of profound um, indeterminacy of self that, that leads in ways that are very unlike the modernist, mm -hmm. um, you know, tradition that we are largely a part of. So I, I, I welcome us all to next next week. Um, thank you so much. And uh, please, if you want to, submit questions or directions. And uh, we'll, we'll continue this with the last session. Uh, thank you so much, Ben. Thank you, everyone, for coming. This has been awesome.